you know, that's $100 million that's going into outdoor dining. But I want to see that money on the streets of Melbourne. I want to see that looking incredibly beautiful. I want those restaurateurs to have the opportunity to actually, you know, win back some money. But I want to see that happening in weeks, not months. And, and I think it's so important for Melbourne that that gets supported and that there's a permit gateway so that these traders are not, you know, fighting through red tape. Today on Dirty Linen, we are talking to Bruce Keebor from The Big Group. Uh, the Big Group is one of Melbourne's biggest, best, and definitely most fabulous catering companies. At this time of year, they would normally be all about the races. Uh, it's a little bit less about the races and yeah, more about hospitality retail, doing something completely different. I thought it would be a great um, opportunity to check in with Bruce. He's about to build something fabulous for Melbourne for summer, but I also think restaurants can learn a lot from caterers at this time uh, when we're all focusing on outdoor dining. Caterers can deal with anything, a tornado, uh, um, yeah, uh, sheeting rain, crying brides, nothing is too much trouble for a caterer like Bruce Keebor. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having a chat. Oh, Danny, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled, thrilled to be here in, the, in, in these most unusual circumstances. Absolutely. You know, I think um, probably exactly a year ago, I was chatting to you for a Melbourne Cup story. They, they do roll around annually. And uh, I was interviewing caterers who were d doing the birdcage and just finding out what was going to be the most fabulous um, place to be over Melbourne Cup weekend. And you said, uh, when we were talking about the photo, you said, oh, I'm going to pull a rabbit out of a hat. And I, I didn't take you literally. But then when I saw the photo, you actually had a top hat and a rabbit. <laughs> well, you know, you said it before, and I think actually the line came from gorgeous Sophie Cooks, you know, like caterers and the way we're wired is to just, you know, make shit happen really quickly because, you know, we're off, often working in a temporary environment. And so the difference between what I call sort of restaurant retail, where you, you know, you design a menu and you test it and it, and it lasts a year and you do a beautiful build and, you know, create an environment and hopefully, you know, that capital lasts five or 10 years. Um, we're sort of doing that every weekend, three times in, in multiple different ways. So, and, and never to the same, you know, design credibility, or well, often we do, but you know, we can't say that out loud. But um, so we're really nimble and we're really flexible. So, yeah, we're working on the edge of a cliff and, you know, the front of the beach and, and table 13 sort of catches on fire and we just, you know, get the get the extinguisher out and extinguish it out and make sure everyone's looking at table one and, and get on with the show. So, you know, not that COVID's been as simple as that, but um, definitely the flexibility skills inside our industry have played to the hand of um, so many people and who I feel so proud of in the event sector who have been able to, you know, change what they can do. And not everyone has had that opportunity, but a lot have done just a brilliant job, you know. Even the picnics, you know, over the last few weeks that people are doing, aren't they brilliant? Yeah, they absolutely are. And it is nice to see so many people out in the parks, even, you know, on uh, nature strips, like really taking advantage of all the nice nooks, crannies and green pockets that we have in Melbourne. There's certainly, you can say what you like about, you know, the wind, the, the rain, you know, whatever it is that Melbourne might throw at us, but there are so many beautiful places to sit and enjoy. Yeah, spread out the blanket. That said, Danny... After being inside for 22 hours a day for nearly seven months, I think, you know, looking out a jail cell and seeing a one fly buzz bar would have been pretty exciting. But, yeah, it is beautiful. I love seeing the kids back in playgrounds and hearing noise again because, you know, what a lot of the rest of Australia don't understand is that, um, you know, we have been in this, you know, the longest lockdown in, in the world um, and it's had a really big toll on people. So joy is a really important thing that has to come through in this next phase of however we um, adapt and whatever trend becomes, um, especially in the food industry, joy has to be an underlying factor because people need that and they bloody need hope as well. So they're really important, important things. But we're getting off topic because you were asking me about Melbourne Cup and um, pulling rabbits out of hats. So yeah, it's a, it's a really strange week for me this week. I feel kind of weirdly emotional about it because grand final is, of course, this Saturday and we've got some activation around that. And next week is, you know, Melbourne Cup, which has sort of been a 30-year history um, it's where we started our business in those car parks out there. So 
I feel really, um, uh, really strange about um, you know what 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 that represents this year. Um, that said, there's been some really good um, initiatives there, and there's some fun stuff going on um, that I'm happy to chat about. But yeah, it's just it's very dynamically different. Yeah. Well, let's just tell me more about how you're feeling. I mean, it's I think there is such a there's so much pride associated with being part of that big Melbourne party and you know I know that the races and and the whole like the the racing industry certainly um has people it's it's not everyone's cup of tea but I think the hospitality experience that's built around it is such a a hub for creativity and innovation in terms of food in terms of creating a feeling and creating events and uh, just that real I guess there's something so Melbourne about it. Like what what does it feel yeah. like for that to be um, so different this year? It's just bizarre. I mean, I, you know, have had the privilege of seeing racing, you know, all around the world and, and multiple events. Like, you know, I can't say that I'm, I'm into Formula One, but, you know, I understand the hospitality aspect of that and, you know, footy and um, and racing and all those codes. But, yeah, I'm not the greatest sports person. But the hospitality piece is, is fascinating because globally, you know, that Melbourne Cup hospitality experience is, is well-renowned. So if you go to Kentucky Derby or Royal Ascot, all they'll talk to you about is the birdcage because they can't believe, you know, what goes on with regards to how hospitality is showcased there. And and I think the bit that, you know, we feel very proud at, at when I look back at it is the collaborations, you know, with chefs and designers and artists and architects and the opportunity that that has given people to showcase their work in multiple different ways. And it also to sort of create an evolution of how brands could activate um, rather than what hospitality looked like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago was very much here's some food and here's some booze and see you later and my better experience is in a restaurant. All of a sudden, you know, these brands sort of said, well, actually, instead of spending a million bucks on an ad that goes nationally and I can't really find an ROI for, I can actually have you know, influences in this environment and I can create a set or a backdrop that will be shared and spread and I can talk about the food and I can talk about the beverage. So we had this ability to share stories and tell so much more for a brand um, through the, you know, the lifestyle experience of of food. So um, seeing that not happen this year, you know, after so many years, um, is a bittersweet thing because, and for me, it's more about, you know, the thousands of people you know, who would be out there working and trucks going round and, you know, Harry's, you know, put out this video which breaks my heart of all their warehouses, you know, full of stock, you know, not one thing, you know, 1,400 people, 1,000 people in their business not working, 1,400 in mine would have been working now. So, you know, we're all, you know, doing everything we can to stay positive and move forward. But you're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of people who right now would be, you know, working and activating. So that that's the, the bittersweet part of it and it'll come back you know humans are like cockroaches we we survive but it, it's getting from a to b that's going to be the hard bit on this um this game yeah gosh that is so sad to think about a, a warehouse full of stuff and what and all the things that that represents um yeah and it's funny because it's a frivolous i i, I always um precursor it say so, you know we, we, we're not brain surgeons right in our industry but um that the piece inside it is that whilst it's frivolous and it's about you know champagne swilling and all of that kind of stuff it it is about jobs and it is about economic impact because you know the girls have got to go down and buy you know something pop on their head and a dress and so that's pushing retail and then you go out to a restaurant after the races it's pushing the food aspect bruce one thing that i think is interesting is that you know restaurants obviously have been doing it super tough this year and you know people are complaining about the various difficulties that still lie ahead but for people in events I mean it's so tough for you guys that you've actually decided to be a restaurant. It's very difficult um, the event sector because you know our journey and our fight on this is going to go on for another six to 12 months so it's been very hard for us to have a voice for the major events sector which is very different to restaurant retail um, and it's not to diminish either I mean everyone's had a really big kick in the guts but we we deal in large-scale numbers we deal in large-scale venues and so globally you know that looks pretty devastating as you know it hasn't come back internationally yet so we've still got another six to 12 months fight on our hands um you know our bridal wedding sector which is a massive part of you know our business and and affects so many sole traders 
um, you know, you still can't have a wedding for more than 10 people. So when will we get to 120, 130, 140 people? So um, the restaurants, you know, have got an opportunity to realise income quite quickly, even if it's only 20, 30, 50 guests, which I know feels for them like, you know, death by slow hanging. But the, the money starts going in the till straight away. Our business has another three, six, 12 month lag. So our challenges are much harder and much longer. And so, yes, um, in order to sort of protect my people, People and and to give us some bloody hope and joy, yeah, we've we, we're going into retail hospitality, and I know I'm opening a restaurant next week, so I could be crazy, but anyway, we're giving it a go. <laughs> it's so interesting. Well, tell us about the Commons, which is the extravaganza you're opening up for us all. Well, you know, it, it's it, it's been so fun because I mean, you know, I, I was talking to someone the other day. You know, if you're an elite sportsman or a ballerina, or you know, you do something precise, to be told you can't do that is extremely difficult. And for me, you know, I've had 30 years of just loving being in business and I love hospitality. I love the people. So to not be able to do what you do is tough. So we had taken over the old um, Ormond Hall and what, what used to be the former Belgian beer bar site about three years ago. And primarily for events, weddings, you know, um, <laughs> bar mitzvahs. And we did quite a few funerals there too. Um, and it's been a great business. And I also had the combined issue that um, we are moving from our site in Cremorne because we're doing a commercial development there. So I had to move the big group headquarters as well. So I sort of woke up in the middle of the night in about, you know, March, April, you know, when COVID was really... <laughs> starting to kick in and I thought you know what let's move our office to that location because it's you know it's got great energy and a great soul so that would sort of fix that part of the problem and then I thought you know what we all need to do something because JobKeeper by then had come in and I thought let's build a garden with all our people and so the 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 sort of the initial premise was just let's build a garden and open a coffee shop and then, you know, yes, we are a bit grandiose at Big Group. So now it's become a fully fledged conservatory, cafe garden, wine bar, kitchen garden, and um, and a big beer garden as well. So it's it's an all outdoor um, dining space running seven days a week in the former Belgian beer bar site. So we're really excited about it. It's fun. It's quite it's quite different in market. It's great. And I mean, the thing that I find interesting as you speak, you like you do keep coming back to this hope and joy and you talk about it in relation to your business and your staff, as well as I suppose what you can offer to people that, that come to spend time with you. Can you talk about those, um, those feelings as a sort of driving force for you? Yeah. I mean, this, this year and next year isn't about profit. It's about people. You know, it'll take us minimum two years to recover what we will have lost in this year. Now, nobody needs to jump inside the balance sheet. That's really boring. But the reality is that that's what it is. So the most important thing is to put our people first. Um, and once we get people back working and we get customers back in, money comes in the end. So if you build a business about making money, I don't think you ever make any. So the focus has to be on the people and, of course, the product. So for me, it was actually about having something to work on that kept my mind focused and could be moving forward to see something where I could, um, you know, see that the business could be purposeful in some way. Equally, um, life puts obstacles all the time. You know, there's always roadblocks. So it's where's the gap? And I, I always say to people, you know, the gap is called business. So once you can find the gap, that's where you need to push the business forward to. So at the moment, the only gap really for retail hospitality um, is outdoor dining. So, you know, I was very lucky to be sitting on a site that, you know, could be you know, very quickly be activated to lean into what will be the trend for this summer um, and into the 2021 year. So that's what's so exciting about it. Look, when when it's pouring with rain, Danny, I'll be sitting there going, oh my God, I've got no customers and I can't put them inside. But in between those days, we'll be able to create a really um, wonderful business. And when you talk about the, the joy and the hope bit, when you come down and have a look at it when we're allowed, which I think will be Sunday, um, you know, all the graphics were done by our guys inside. They're all, you know, flowers and bumblebees and ladybirds and you know it, it, it it's you know big bushy hydrangeas and flowers and you know burgers and fries it's everything's sort of happy you know so we want people to come there and and have joy and and our guys can't wait to greet people because we want to get back to doing what we do mm. well you know, we we said at the start you know caterers can deal with pretty much anything can you talk me through some of the crazy things that you've had to deal with the solutions that you've come up with um, in the moment and then 
we can talk about, you know, how how people, how restaurant people that are more used to being able to control their environments might be able to learn from you and <laughs> approach any kind of uh, <laughs> meteorological event with, uh, with um, yeah, joy and optimism. Yeah, well, I'll give you the one of my favourite ones is when we first started going to the Middle East about 10 years ago to do um, private events over there, um, we were given two camels and um, told we needed to have them cooked and prepared in six hours. And I was like, oh, oh my God, do you mean one hump or two? I mean, <laughs> serious, <laughs> seriously, how does one cook a baby camel? Um, but, um, you know, we did learn how. And if you do look on YouTube, there are some things there on how to cook camel. But then to Silver servant, let me tell you, that is a very uh, challenging task. Um, but once again, somewhere in the palace, we found a very big <laughs> silver trolley with two humps on it, and off we went. So, um, you know, oh, you always find... You, I, love you, I know. That's dead true too. Um, you do always find a way through because you know our, 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 our you know that that's the way it rolls in hospo um, for for eventing. So um, yeah, so that's just our adaptability. You just got to make it work. You know, you just got to find the solution all the time because there's always problems, but it's much harder to find solutions. I mean, do you think it's about the attitude that you approach these problems with? You know, where it's less like, you know, oh you know, bad weather forecast, you know, throw your hands up in the air, feel sad. Is it? Is it? Is there another attitude that you can apply to the situation? Yeah, there is. And I'm not flippant about this, but I, you know, I always say I've had the luxury and the privilege of waking up every morning feeling positive, right? And that doesn't happen for everyone. You know, like my daughter once said to us when she was about 14, she said, you need to know it's really annoying because I don't wake up like that. I wake up feeling shit every day. And it's sort of like, oh God, you know, that was news to me. So, you know, having a positive attitude is a privilege. Um, but but equally, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. You know, if you keep looking at the empty bit, then you can't actually strive to the other piece. That said, if you don't look at the negatives of the situation, you can't swat it and you can't find the opportunities. So you can't be unrealistic. But I think our, part of our role um, in this industry, um, and especially in hospitality, is to, you know, guide and bring people together. And, you know, we're showmen. You know, we're putting on a theatre every day, whether it's in a restaurant or whether it's in a major event. Our job is to provide experiences to the people who give us money to do so. So I believe we have a really big obligation to keep the show on the road. So my own personal, you know, shit and horror that I've gone through over this COVID thing, that has to be kept in my own environment because when I go out and put the show on, my job is to, you know, impact that onto all the chefs and all our waiters and our back of house people to make sure that, you know, it, it is a good show for our paying customers. Mm. I mean, is that a big burden to carry that you sort of hold that for your team and and then in turn flowing onto the public? Um, yeah, I do. I suppose, you know, if we if we want to break that down, yeah, I do. I feel a great moral sense of responsibility um, to make this work for our people and for the industry. And I, I take that really seriously. So I don't think I've got the opportunity to sit and complain. My, my role is to push forward um, in whatever direction we can. I mean, you know, for me, the next fight is really about the event sector and the wedding sector. And the Commons is a, is a small, great thing, which is wonderful for our business and it's wonderful for our people. But there's still bigger fights that have to keep on going. And I must stay focused on that as well as enjoying the joy and the fun of, of the retail business. So, um, you know, y y y you sort of need to juggle lots of balls in the air. I think that's your responsibility as a business owner. Yeah, I mean, I think people are going to be having quite profound experiences in hospitality over the next few months in in Melbourne. I think you know, if I if I think about all the friends that I haven't seen, the people that I haven't been able to catch up with, but also that feeling that you get when you're looked after in a restaurant. I mean, it is it is quite a it's it's very meaningful. It's very real. You know, it is it is a, a site where people create create really meaningful memories, and I think it's um. It's an emotional transfer. You know, I, I'm having this funny thing with the guys at the moment. Like, I was fighting very hard to DHSS so that we could have the clear masks for hospitality staff because I believe you need to see someone smile. I need, you, you know, you can smile with your eyes only so much, but, you know, part of our, our thing is this emotional transaction between them. I and there's nothing worse than someone, you know, I always hated when I went to a fancy restaurant and they gave me the wine list. I didn't know what to choose. You know, they make you feel less. You know, this is your special occasion where you're spending 50 
50 bucks or 5 million bucks. You know, it needs to be, you know, a beautiful experience all the way through. So, yeah, I didn't want that. I wanted the clear thing, not the mask, because I think in hospitality, you know, our faces are so much the, the, the windows of the business kind of thing. Anyway, so, it, yeah, it is. I think there'll be so many people so excited to come back and, you know, see their friends and to not cook for yourself anymore. I just, like, <laughs> I want service. <laughs> I think it's the service. I think people have been able to eat pretty well at home. Um, of course, you know, restaurant food is a different matter. There has been some amazing dining, dine at home experiences as well. But I think it's that feeling of hospitality of being in places together. I think if I, that's what I'm really yearning for. Um, and I yeah. think it will be. And it's the environmental piece. Yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting, but it's going into those different environments that that restaurateur or, you know, that event created, that, that, there's a sensory thing there that's so exciting. Mm, yeah. I do think the masks thing is going to be interesting. I think it's exhausting to wear a mask for a long period of time. So I, f I feel like it's, um, yeah, I don't know how you deal with that when you're with, with staff. Um, it's certainly a factor and they do have to work harder to be heard, to, to, to listen and to, yeah, transfer, to have that emotional um emotional transfer because yeah as it is obviously much harder to express yourself on the flip though you know part of our obligation and when we you know go back to the sort of the serious part of it is we if we are choosing to lead the way by opening you know this outdoor thing next week um, and we're one of the first we have to provide the safest covid environment to the highest um, hygiene standards etc 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 so you know it, it, it's more arduous to go back into lockdown than it is to maintain wearing masks so whatever has to be done is what we've got to do but the same theory applies. We have to make COVID cool. We have to make COVID acceptable and normal and palatable for our customers and fun. So, you know, when you come to the commons, you know, we've built all these little bird houses and so you can sanitise your hands whilst you do your QR code. So by the time you're ready for check-in, your table's ready and they'll take you all the way through. So we have to make those things seamless. You know, we've got little COVID butlers going around and, you know, making sure the bathrooms are, you know, fully sanitised the whole time. And we've got Dougal, our fabulous COVID concierge, who'll be, you know, zooming around making sure people aren't you know you know having too much fun so it's important that for the industry we maintain you know these regulations so that we don't go backwards we have to we have to you know do it slowly and, and correctly mm. and going back to, to to events i mean what kinds of differences do you think you're going to have to think of to create covid safe event spaces like what are the sort of what are yeah how are you putting an argument forward that you can do it in a safe way that's such an easy argument and i suppose that's what i found extremely frustrating about this i mean the event sector is very well versed with regards to protocol so you know after 9 11 you know we had terror plans in every every event that we did fire evacuation is nothing to us um you know high-end security protocols with regards to diplomats you know dignitaries coming through they're all second nature to what eventing is all about so to add on the COVID protocols and you know, the six standards of, of disciplines there that's just like adding bolting one more thing on you know no different than engineering so I think that the industry is really well versed there I mean things like smart badge that um, you know Aspen Medical and Harry the Hira put together um, you know can track trace and isolate people immediately in a, in a venue with 5,000 people in it so we've got the tech to do it it's just not being it's, it's getting government to understand that we've actually already done the work we, we're adaptable and we're ready to roll so you know that 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 piece is t frightfully frustrating What's Smart Badge? Smart Badge is this piece. So, you know, Harry the Hira, who, you know, Melbourne's Australia's probably biggest hirer. Um, he, that Rick and his team created with Aspen Medical this little lanyard, or once again, it can go as a little watch. And what it does is when you check in, so, you know, when you go to a normal event, you go to registration. And remembering, we know the names, email, data, whether they have gluten intolerance or not. We've got quite a lot of information in our let's call it 1,000 participants in an event. So as soon as they arrive, they get their smart badge, put it on, and um, that's coded you into the event. And then say you and I you know, have a chat for three minutes together um, and you then go and sit at a table with 10 other people. If there was any incident of a COVID issue you know, at the end of that event, we can then print it out the data and we can eradicate out maybe 95% of the guests because it's only really the guests you sat at the table with for you know, two hours or three minutes that we need to pull out to track, trace and isolate. So it's a very good tool to use for the event industry. Right. So it's like the government's COVID app, except... 
but it didn't won't. quite do that. Yeah, yeah, co correct. It works, but it also gets time down to the second. So the, unfortunately, the Govern app will tell you geo map that you were there, but it won't tell you who you interacted with. So this allows you to curate out of those 1,000 people to say 800 actually never came in contact with Danny Valan, but these 100 did. Oh, and these 20 were there for two and a half hours with her. These 80 were only there for one minute. So it, it, the data information is there. It also means that in real time, so say we've got um, 100 groups of 10 um, you know, in, in pods, it means that if someone from pod A goes to pod B, the security can see that on camera straight away and go to those environments and make sure that you know actually you need to go back to pod A and you need to be in pod B. So we're seeing the movement of people live in real time at events. So it allows us to actually manage the environment. So it, we're, we're mitigating risk um, much better than the um, government app. And so hang on, what is the tracking device? Is it a lanyard that everyone's wearing? Yeah, it's like a lanyard like you'd normally wear with your name and your company on it, but it's actually got a little tracking piece in there. And as by signing up for the event, people are happy to sign up, you know, to, you know, have the data and things there so that, you know, the information can be there immediately. Okay. Interesting. Um, what about things like uh, waiters passing around trays of food, that kind of thing? Can you see that coming back or do you feel like we're going to be into a new style of, um, of yeah, event dining? I think we're not going to see groaning buffets with strawberries, chocolate and salami all wrapped over it, which is a blessing. Um, I think we'll go to more packaged individual. You know, I think individual will become really chic, so you'll have your own little thing. I mean, I do worry about the, the packaging of the world, but, you know, that we'll worry about that later. But, yes, I think individual becomes big again. I think passing and sharing in dining environments isn't as high. Um, we're using gloves for our staff, like the, the staff down at the Commons will all be in gardening gloves. Um, so I think it, it's it's very important to slow down the reciprocal rate of how many people touch things. Contactless payment, you know, being able to actually sit at your spot, um, pay, order, or within one app, I think is really important. And then your rosé just gets brought to you on the table and you serve yourself. So wherever we can, we're trying to cut down that that um, staff interaction piece. Now, that is great for HOSPO in many ways because it helps margins, but it also might speed up service, but it also might uh, lean into the COVID issues. Mm, yeah, and then it's all about how do you create that, that hospitality feeling in and around that well, the way we're doing it is then re-engineering the wins that we have from the labour, because labour isn't our worst thing at the moment while we've got JobKeeper support, but where we're having the wins from the labour, where the apps are supporting um, the service methodology, we're using that for customer in, 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 you know, in, yeah, customer engagement. You know, so we're chatting to people and talking to them about the story and making sure their umbrellas giving them shade, etc. So that that's the way we're going to use it. Yeah, uh, it all sounds very hopeful and promising. Like, what do you think the mood of Melbourne's going to be over summer? I reckon we're going to have a great summer. I really hope that, you know, these numbers stay down because there, there's two different markets. You know, you've got the people who are really in that rat hole and they can't get out of it, you know, and, and they've just been pushed too far and emotionally it's really difficult for them to see light. And then you've got the others who are, like, at the rat hole opening, running, you know, dying to get down there. And, and you know, from the Premier's point, of view, you know, you would have had 50,000 people in Swan Street all going crazy for grand final. So I do get some of the sensibility because we've got to find that path in the middle where we can have, you know, joy and fun. And so our job really when we open the commons is going to be to provide joy but keep everyone seated and keep them in their, you know, their groups of 10 and, you know, ensure that it doesn't turn into a mosh pit. But I think I think the customer's changed. You know, I think there's been such an emotional um, shift. I mean, my expectations, you know, I think we were getting spoiled and lazy. You know, like if I didn't get a certain seat in a certain spot, be it on a plane or in a restaurant, I think, oh, I'm a bit miffed. Now, literally, I'm sitting on the curb having a bloody sandwich and I've never been so happy. So I think we're <laughs> going to become more forgiving and, and more gracious. And, and Hospo especially in the restaurant sector, was having a really tough time. You know, a lot of people weren't charging the true price of what a cup of coffee cost. And if you've got to charge seven fifty, well, bloody do it. Because, But make it the best cup of coffee you can serve. But if it has to be seven fifty, do it and have the margins to protect your staff and to have profitability in your business and, and choose your market. And if you've got to charge $75 for a steak, bloody do that as well. Um, but pick your market, and that's the most important thing to protect business because running at 1% and 2% is not the art of good business, and especially when a situation like this comes along and you haven't got 
nest egg, you're up the creek. So we have to re-engineer how these businesses look like. Yeah, I think there's yeah, so much wisdom in what you've just said. I just hope that, you know, some of those people that aren't aren't bursting out of the rat hole, I feel like the people that are like zooming out will just perhaps take some of those other people, well, we can't say by the hand, but um, they'll lure them out and they can start, you know, seeing the light again, seeing the sunshine and enjoying some of the things that Melbourne is going to be able to offer them. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Danny, $100 million, you know, from the state and um, city council, you know, that's $100 million that's going into outdoor dining. I, and I can guarantee you I haven't got one cent of that, but I want to see that money on the streets of Melbourne. I want to see that looking incredibly beautiful. I want those restaurateurs to have the opportunity to actually, you know, win back some money. You know, so I can't wait to see what happens in Domain Road and Ligon Street. But I want to see that happening in weeks, not months. And and I think it's so important for Melbourne that that gets supported and that there's a permit gateway so that these traders are not, you know, fighting through red tape because that's they can't take any more, these guys. They actually need... Um, support. I'm lucky because we have an infrastructure and we have scale and we just, if we want to do something, I, I've got the luxury to be able to do that. But not everybody does. And so I want that 100 million. I want to see it. I want to count it up. <laughs> you know what? There, just um, there is some volunteer planning support for people trying to negotiate the City of Melbourne planning process. So if anyone would like to take advantage of that, um, just get in touch uh, with me via the podcast Instagram or however you can find me and I will hook you up with that because I, I think, yeah, That's so much brilliant. of that. Yeah, it is amazing. So it's people from Planning Victoria, I think they're called, and they're volunteering their time to assist people in negotiating some of those forms. Um, amazing. Because, yeah, it is, but we do, and isn't that, like, I just think that is such a great example of how different sectors of the city are pulling together because we're all on the same side here. We all want our city back. Totally. We all want to be enjoying life in, uh, you know, ways that we were used to. But as you say, like, let's also do it in such a way that works for everybody and businesses should not be um, subsidising the true cost of dining. It just doesn't, it just shouldn't be like that. We, yeah, if we want it, we need to pay for it. No, I'm happy to see this shift in the customer, you know, like when, when I go to my little local coffee shop down there, you know, I like seeing everyone smiling and they're trying to support their trader. And, you know, I just think if it's another dollar, it's it's another dollar, but you know that it's actually going into the business and into the people. That's the most important. Yeah, and we know those businesses need it and we know that the people do as well. Bruce, um, so great to have you on. Um, just love your energy and spirit and uh, thank you for what you are bringing to Melbourne during this very challenging time. Um, yeah, really look forward to being back at one of your events in the not too distant future. Um, and yeah, I just. But in between time, I'll see you at the Commons. I'm going to come down to the Commons and um, sit on <laughs> a lily pad table and wait for someone to bring me a rose, <laughs> and I will very happily pour it myself because then I can give myself a bit extra. <laughs> well, I hope I'm there because I'll probably be the one bringing it. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks so much for chatting. Okay. Nice to talk. See you. Bye. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production. <laughs>